All right. Uh, on that note of me potentially visiting London, and we'll have to grab coffee or something. Um, I, I think that we're ready to begin our event. So I'd just like to say thank, thank you all for coming today. Uh, welcome to the Iran 1400s Spotlighting an Author event. Today, we will be discussing Professor Stephanie Cronin's new book, Social Histories of Iran, Modernism and Marginality in the Middle East. And I'd like to take a minute to explain the Iran 1400 project for those who might not be familiar with it. The goal of the Iran 1400 project is to encourage healthy and productive conversations about Iran rather than shouting and posturing. Uh, the project hopes to make a constructive contribution to understanding Iran and aspires to better interpret Iran's past and present in order to more accurately perceive what Iranians consider a viable future for their country. You can find us at iran1400.org. There you can find our content in English and in Farsi, and we'll have articles, videos, podcasts, and events such as this one about ideas and institutions like modernity, identity, education, fine arts, and so on. If you scroll to the bottom of our website, you can actually sign up for our newsletter, and that will keep you up to date with your email on all of our upcoming events. Also, you can find us on all the social media platforms at Iran1400project. Now, I'd like to introduce our uh, guest today, uh, Dr. Stephanie Cronin is Alahe Omidyar Mir Jalali Research Fellow at St. Anthony's College and is a member of the Faculty of Oriental Studies at the University of Oxford. She's the author and editor of multiple books and journal articles on Middle Eastern and Iranian history, most recently, including Crime, Poverty, and Survival in the Middle East in North Africa, The Dangerous Classes Since 1800, which uh, came out in 2019, and Armies and State Building in the Modern Middle East, Politics, Nationalism, and Military Reform, uh, published in 2013. Now, before we begin, our communications manager, Tabi Anvari, will share a few remarks on behalf of the Iran 1400 Project. Thank you, Sydney. Dr. Cronin, on behalf of the advisory board of Iran 1400 Project, I would like to extend a warm welcome to you and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to share your valuable insights with us. It is an honor and a pleasure, as is what said, to have one of the most prolific and significant historians on modern Iran as part of these series. Definitely your body of work continues to provide a fresh look into Iran from a global, transnational, and comparative perspective, and restores a sense of coherence to the discourse on the social history of Iran. We are excited to have you speak with us today and look forward to benefiting from your analysis and exploration. Once again, welcome. Thank you, Tabby. Uh, before we begin, I would like to explain the format, and then after that, uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Cronin. So for the event, we will have 30 minutes of listening to Dr. Cronin discuss her book, and then after that, we'll have a 30 minutes to 45 minutes for a, a Q&A session. And viewers, if y'all would like to ask questions, please do so in either the Zoom chat or you can email questions to media at iran1400.org. And we'll hopefully be able to get to everyone's questions after Dr. Cronin presents her book. Now, one last thing, uh, we'll have a quick teaser. And then after that, Dr. Cronin, uh, you'll be able to discuss your book. Thank you. <laughs> 
floor is yours, Dr. Cronin. Thank you very much. Um, let me first of all thank Iran 1400 for giving me this opportunity to talk about my book. I'm very grateful to them and I'm very grateful to Tabby and Sydney for such a kind introduction. So many thanks, adieu. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to talk about my book and, and perhaps to highlight some of the things that I thought were, were most interesting and perhaps most significant in terms of Iran's history. What I should begin by saying, I think, is that this book really began as a textbook. I thought it would be a good idea to try to write a social history of Iran in a fairly straightforward chronological kind of way. Because although we now have very, very good, excellent monographic work on Iranian social history, we don't yet really have a single volume which brings all that together, all that um, new research together, and which makes it accessible to undergraduates and graduate students who might not be sufficiently familiar with Iranian history to engage with the, the monographic work and the work published in scholarly journals, but who would very much benefit and enjoy being able to read um, a fairly straightforward uh, history of Iran's, the ways Iranian society developed in the 19th and 20th century. We don't, re we don't really have that yet. A lot of the textbooks which have been published concentrate on the political history and include very little about social history. So I thought it would be a good idea to try to plug that gap. In fact, once I got working on the book, it took a slightly different direction. Um, and I found that there, there, there were still so many um, aspects of the social history of Iran that really hadn't received very much attention was still a little bit obscure. Um, so it was very difficult to find the basis for, uh, for a textbook. So what I decided to do instead was to focus on certain, what I thought were certain key subjects to try to investigate a little bit more the history and the historiography uh, of Iranian society. And one of the things I noticed in particular was that Iran's experience of modernity, if you like, Iran's social history in the 19th and 20th century was very similar to the experiences of other countries, other countries in the region, other countries in the Middle East, and even you could argue countries in Europe and in the country where I speak from, which is, is England. But there was a great deal of similarity in how people experienced modernity and how they reacted to it. And I thought it would be interesting to try to look at this in some detail, to try to see how the global and the transnational dimensions of Iranian modernity um, borrowed from, drew on, or, or were influenced by developments elsewhere. And it seemed to me that much scholarship still tended towards to, to seeing Iran in isolation. This sense of Iran as participating in global historical processes seemed to be missing. Um, so the book really became a series of experiments. It, it abandoned the straightforward chronological approach, which I had originally tried to do. Uh, in favor of a thematic approach, particularly asking how global and transnational and comparative perspectives could help us understand what was going on in Iran. So Iran remained the center of my interest, but I wanted to place it in a geographical and a historical and a regional context to try to see what was similar between Iran and the rest of the world, and what is different? What is, is, is there something which is unique to Iran, the Iranian experience or can we understand it better as a version 
of a, of a global experience. So there were two key paradigms that I wanted to challenge. The first of these is what's the, no, it's, it's a rather grand phrase, um, methodological nationalism. But what it really means is something quite simple, which is this idea that um, it's the territory defined by the state and the population within those borders, which is the focus of all analysis, that you can understand Iranian history um, by looking at uh, the experiences in Iran and only that way. Um, and I thought that was a mistake. The other, the other key paradigm that I wanted to challenge is this idea of top-down modernization, that um, change in general, and particularly modern, modernism, was a project of the elite and was state-driven. And what I wanted to look at is how other social classes, non-state actors, if you like, in fact, played a role which is at least, if not more important than the roles played by elites and states. So those were the two, the two um, general propositions that I, I wanted to challenge in this book. Um, and the book remained focused on what's called subaltern social groups lower class social groups, working class, it, there are a variety of terms which could be used. Um, but these groups will be united by the fact that they were outside the traditional or modern elites. And uh, some of these I uh, mentioned in my introduction. One particular focus of interest were what it is called the dangerous classes. Um, that is to say, uh, groups whom the older elites viewed as actually a threat to the health and well-being of society. That was one, one group of people. I also wanted to look at the experience of um, poverty. And I took as the, the, the focus for this interest, the question of famine and the reaction of the poor in the form of bread riots. Um, and I wanted to see that again in the context of a larger story about the disintegration of Iranian paternalism and its replacement by the free market, which happens in, begins to happen in the middle, late 19th century and accelerates thereafter. Another interesting focus was the question of crime. Um, we have very little study of crime in, in, in Iranian history, very little study. I mean, we have a lot of accounts by political prisoners of their experience of imprisonment, but we have almost nothing which looks at the experience of criminals, of ordinary people who engage in criminal activity and go to prison and so on, almost nothing. And I thought it was quite interesting <clears throat> to investigate this question of crime and what it meant. Um, so I chose a, a range of, of subaltern groups, both because of it, their own experience is very interesting, but also because they help us to understand the wider societies of which they are part. They help us to understand the nature of politics and uh, uh, the nature of, of those processes of change, which, which I've outlined. Um, in particular, I was interested in how these subaltern groups were counterpoised to the praxis of modernism in general. Um, this is um, that the idea of modernism is a fantastically powerful idea in Iran, in the Middle East, and around the world in the late 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and I wanted to look beyond the kind of rather basic ideas that we have about modernism in Iran, 
to see, to try to, to, to depict something that was really incredibly ambitious and which reached down into people's lives in a very intimate way and even into their psychology. Um, so that the most intimate layers of everyday life experience the power of modernism as it came uh, from, from above. And how did they react to it? And how did it change society? And were the changes permanent? So those are the kinds of social groups that I wanted to look at. Um, and as, uh, as Tabby mentioned in her introduction, I wanted to look at them not just by trying to understand what happened to them in the narrow Iranian context, but by looking at how the experiences of these lower class groups was shaped by transnational and global developments. So it's, got, it's quite a simple idea. It's that these narratives take their starting point from the notion that what happens in Iran or any other national environment is always part of something much bigger and can be understood. It can be better understood once it's seen as part of something bigger. So I wanted to look at the experience of Iran because most of my work has been done on Iranian history, but I also wanted to, to broaden the lens um, and introduce a discussion of the surrounding regions and countries so that we could look at Iran in the same frame as we look at the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Republic, the Arab world and North Africa and even the former Ottoman territories in the Balkans to see how the experiences of those countries compared and shed light on what was going on in Iran. Um, and insofar as the book, as I said, it's really a series of experiments, but I, I think it's held together by, by its approach. It's focused on below, but also it's tracing the impact of specific transnational relationships and, in, and, and integrating specific global historical processes. So I think in a way it's the methodology which provides the kind of unifying theme of the book. Most of my work has been done on um, Iran in the late 19th and first half of the 20th century. But the first chapter of the book is, is a discussion of the revolution of 1977-79, because I thought that the Iranian revolution is, is an event par excellence which can be understood from a transnational and global perspective. Uh, and it really is. Uh, in fact, if you look at the literature on the Iranian revolution, you see that it's a typical example of this fracture which has taken place between Iran and Iranian history and the history of other countries and of the world. When, when we look at uh, work that's been done on, and, and met, in much of it is very good, no doubt, on explaining the revolution, it tends to focus very much on the Iranian prelude to the revolution the oil nationalization crisis, um, the nature of the Shah's government, the nature of the authorities, its foreign relation orientation. So we look at these things as explanations for the revolution. Um, very rarely taking into account the wider context within which this revolutionary process developed. Um, and at the same time, Work which is done, for example, on um, the global student movement in the 60s and 70s, hardly ever takes into account the Iranian experience. We have the one very good book by Ashin um, Matinaskari, which looks at the Iranian student movement. But when we look at glo global studies of the global student movement, Iran is somehow left out. The Middle East is somehow left out, somehow left out. So what I wanted to do really was to, to, to read back the global experience into Iranian history, but also to make Iranian history more accessible to pe people working on other areas, on other countries, and in transnational and global history. 
so that Iran would become more of a presence in that wider literature. Uh, what, what, now, when we look at the revolution, what is interesting about the transnational and comparative global perspectives? And we can see that much of the, the literature, and, and I think also amongst the wider society, there still exists a kind of bafflement about the Iranian revolution, that uh, it, it somehow, although you can, add, you can add up and make a list of the grievances that people had, and perhaps the the, the the mishandling of the situation by the authorities and so on and so on. You can come, you can make a long list of all the problems. It doesn't really explain why Iran in the late 70s had this incredible eruption of political dissent. Because plenty of countries in the region across the Middle East have similar experiences of a frustrated younger generation of a very unequal distribution of wealth, of an unpopular pro-American foreign policy orientation. In fact, you would say in the 60s and 70s, most countries across the Middle East had a similar political issue, but they didn't have revolutions. So how can we begin to explain why there was a revolution in Iran? This is still hard. It's still, it's still a, a, a nettle which no one has really grasped. And what I wanted to do was to point out something about the 1960s and 70s, which explained the, the power of the opposition movement in the Iranian context. And when you look at the, for example, the global processes, you can see quite easily that there were several specific global processes which contributed materially to the Iranian revolution. One of these, for example, was what's called the education revolution. So we see post-World War II around the world and in Iran, there is a tremendous investment by modernizing states in the education system. So a country like Iran and many others produce a generation by the 60s and 70s, which is university educated, but for whom very little opportunity to improve their situation really exists. So you have this buildup of frustration and disappointed hopes among the younger generation, which makes them ripe for um, political radicalism. And you see this younger generation everywhere, most obviously is in Paris in 1968, but you see it everywhere, in every country of the, of the globe practically. I think there are very few countries that don't experience this, um, this particular phenomenon. And this is the generation that drives the, the, the revolutionary movement. Uh, this, is the generation, this is the generation which provides the leadership and the foot soldiers for, for this revolutionary movement. Uh, and it's a global movement. And then again, you see other things which Iran shares with the rest of the world. And I think this, this was one of the things I tried to do because a lot of the literature on the revolution tries to point out what was different about Iran to the rest of the world. So people talk about, for example, the role of the ulama. They talk about Shiism as explanations for the revolution. But what I wanted to do was talk about what was similar between Iran and the rest of the world. And a great deal is similar. We can look at the radicalization of this generation, which took place around the world. And this generation was reading the same literature. It was following events in the same way. Um, and it, just, it, at least an element amongst it, uh, satisfied itself by going as far as possible and taking up uh, armed resistance to regimes identified as reactionary. And this, of course, happened in Iran in an almost textbook case. So in 1971, you have the launch of the guerrilla movement in Iran, and you have throughout the 70s these, these actions being carried out by groups which are almost identical to the groups in, for example, Latin America, who are carrying out the same kind of actions according to the same kind of political project reading the same material, 
and having the same links with each other. So again, I think there are, there are several different ways in which you can see Iran as part of a global process here. Um, again, technology changes. Um, we have uh, ease of travel. And this is also very, very important in terms of explaining the Iranian revolution. Because again, the younger generation is traveling, it's traveling around the world. It goes to America, it goes to Europe, and it also looks at Latin America and it looks at other, other radical movements in the Middle East. So Iranians go to Dofar, for example, where there is a, a nationalist, radical nationalist movement in, in, in power. It goes to the Palestinian camps in Lebanon and it picks up ideas and it picks up visions of the future and it picks up methods and strategies and tactics. So again, the, you can see the, the, the most radical elements of the Iranian youth was very much linked in to what was going on around the world. But again, a, a comparative approach is very useful because it brings out these connections. Uh, if you try to compare what was going on in Latin America with what's happening in the Middle East, it does actually shed light on some of this. Um, and I think also um, a global context can shed light, not just on the causes of the revolution, but on why the revolution took the course or took the path that it did. Because by the late 1970s, this kind of radical dynamic, which had been so strong in the 60s and early 70s, was beginning to run out of steam. And it was beginning to be replaced by, on the one hand, Islamic politics, Islamism, uh, and on the other, uh, 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 as another dimension of this, um, by neoliberal economics and by a general turning away from the political radicalism of the earlier period. So in a way, you can see the revolution as, as happening at a, kind of, uh, at a kind of crossroads, that this is where the tectonic plates start to shift. And we go from the radical leftism of the 60s and 70s into a period dominated in the Middle East by Islamism and, and in Europe and the US by uh, neoliberal economics. So you have a revolution which is born in the 60s and 70s, but which makes, reaches maturity in a very different context. So I think that's why the revolution has this, this curious, curious character and people can never really just work out what it was um, and why in the end it turned out to be so very different to the, 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 the to, to, to what the, the revolutionaries themselves thought it would be like. So you have a revolution which is a, a paradox. Um, and I think, again, this can be explained more successfully by looking at global processes than by looking simply at what's happening in Iran itself. Um, I'll continue to talk about the chapters, I think, separately, but I'll, I'll go through them a little bit quicker because time is limited. Um, obviously, the revolution is 40 years ago, but it's part of, 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 of Iranian mod modernity. If we go back to the 19th century, we can look um, at what was happening in the earlier period, if you like, below the radar. And again, I looked, the first, the first issue that I wanted to look at was this question of the food whether people had enough food and what happened when they didn't have food. Um, and one of the things that happens when this situation of food insecurity develops is that people take action of their own. And, and, and the, the, the most obvious and natural action to take is to besiege the, the bakers and to demand redress from the authorities. And again, I thought uh, to use a comparative approach was very useful because a lot of work has been done in European social history on famine and dearth and bread riots. And one, one uh, piece of work in particular is very well known, which is E.P. Thompson's work on the moral economy. 
And I thought it would be interesting to approach the Iranian case by looking for this moral economy. Do Iranian bread riots exhibit this moral economy? And what we mean by a moral economy is this notion that food is a right, a right particularly bread, uh, that, that human beings have a right to bread. And it's, it is morally wrong to do anything which deprives people of their daily bread. And I found that this idea of the moral economy, which was first articulated by uh, E.P. Thompson, but which became very popular among European social historians, this idea of the moral economy could be found very easily in the Iranian case. So Iranian bread rioters, it, it's one way of try, trying to find out <clears throat> what are the politics of social groups who are generally considered to be pre-political. And in fact, this idea of pre-political is quite misleading because you can see when you look at bread riots, you can see that people have a very clear idea of the political system that they are in and how to deal with it. And one of the things that E.P. Thompson showed me is that it was important to look for the sources of legitimacy on which bread rioters drew, that they were not simply hungry people out to, to, to plunder shops, but they actually had a sense of their own legitimacy. And where was their legitimacy drawn from? Since most of them were illiterate, it's very interesting to see where did they get these ideas from. And one of the area, one of the, the sources of their legitimacy is, is Islam itself. Because what you find when you look at Islamic scholars, uh, and especially when you look at Muhtasibs and their Hizba manuals, you see that Islam prohibits things like hoarding, um, price, price, and unrealistic price rises, speculation. The, so the, the, the Muhtasib would regulate the market according to these uh, ideas. So when the system broke down, the population had a kind of ready-made sense of, religi uh, of religious legitimacy. Hoarding, speculation was wrong. It was morally wrong. Uh, and you are entitled to resist it. Other sources comes, <clears throat> excuse me. There are other sources of legitimacy. For example, um, Mirror for Princes, the literature on how to be a good ruler, again, specifically states uh, that it's the duty of a ruler to provide the population with bread. If you can't do that, you relinquish your, your legitimacy. In return for the provision of the guarantee of the provision of bread, the population is required to owe you loyalty and pay taxes. So there's a kind of bargain going on. This is also reflected in the circle of justice literature, the same sort of idea. The ruler is legitimate as long as he carries out his legitimate responsibilities. If he doesn't, and th this step wasn't always taken, if it, but as far as, as the population itself was concerned, if they don't do that, then people are entitled to take action in their own hands and go and take bread. It's available, it's just too expensive, so you can go and take it. So in short, um, this question of how we can excavate the politics of subaltern groups was, uh, had a light shone on it by E.P. Thompson's work and the, talk, the work of British and European social history, which was really quite crucial in terms of helping me to understand what was going on. Um, again, um, as I mentioned slightly earlier, there is a chapter on the dangerous classes. And I think this is perhaps my favorite chapter in the book um, because it allowed me to look at all sorts of social groups whose experience again is, is rather similar to the experiences of uh, groups in other countries. I'll give one example. This, this is a case from Egypt, a, a case of serial killing. 
Um, there, there are two similar cases in, in Iran in the 20s and 30s. So we have these multiple cases of serial killing. And it's quite interesting to see how the serial killer emerges and is a product of modernism. And if you look at the history of, uh, of, of, the, of the country that I'm in, the history of, 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 of England, you see a very famous example of serial killing in the case of Jack the Ripper in the late 19th century in Whitechapel. And probably almost everyone around the world has heard of this case. And when we look at, e at Iran and Egypt, you see a similar phenomenon emerging. You see the conditions being created in terms of, for example, uh, press, newspapers, who can shape narratives, um, policemen, detectives, forensic medicine, and a public which is able to read the newspapers and, and think about what this actually means. So serial killing, we, we, we find these examples in Iran and Egypt, is really a modern phenomenon. Now, it's quite possible that, of course, you have serial killers in the past, but they were undetectable. You couldn't actually trace them. Now you can. And these cases are used, really, as pegs on which to hang a much broader discussion about what is happening to society. What is happening to women, because as, as is often the case, usually the case, maybe always the case, women are the victims here. So what is it about changing gender roles which is creating these, these dangers? So there's all sorts of discussions about how changing gender roles, how women's emancipation is creating this kind of difficulties for society. So women being independent, mobile, unveiled, is, is giving rise to the phenomenon of serial killing. And then, of course, you have the opposite, uh, the opposite argument being made. But they are immensely important in terms of both revealing and enabling the articulation of all sorts of fears about how rapidly society is changing and what the negative as well as the positive consequences of this change might be. So I, I, I particularly enjoyed this, this chapter on the dangerous classes because partly because it tells you so much about lives which are usually hidden, but also because it enables you to understand the much bigger picture of modernism and state building and, uh, and, and, and change in general. Um, I think perhaps my time is, is becoming short. How long do I have to, to Sydney? Can I continue five minutes? Yes, take as much time as you need, but Thank you. Uh, we are hoping to, uh, whenever you wrap up, begin the Q&A section. But as long, I'll say, as long as you have the time, uh, yeah, if we go over certainly. an hour, that's what we're worried about. We, we don't want to take up your time. No, certainly. I, 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 I think I've said I, I would like to make a few more remarks. Sure, Another, please do. A chapter, the chapter towards the end of the book is, is looks at slaves. And of course, you would think that slavery was a pre-modern phenomenon. Um, but one of the things that you see, again, is, is how slavery, and we think in the West of slavery being abolished, but I think when you look at the Middle East, you get a clearer picture of how slavery changes and ceases to be slavery, but becomes some other kind of, of, of dependence or, um, for example, um, indebtedness becomes a form of slavery. But what I really wanted to do in slavery -ish, in the slavery chapter was look at, again, use a comparative perspective to look at two particularly thorny issues in slavery studies, especially slavery studies in the Middle East. The first of these is the question of slave agency. And uh, agency is a, is a key word which pops up time and time again when you're looking at social history. So looking for agency is a very important dimension of looking at, at, at uh, underrepresented groups. And it's often argued <clears throat> that um, slave agency is a kind of static thing, that, that either slaves have agency or they don't. But what I wanted to demonstrate 
in, in my narrative is that slave agency is actually very closely connected to the kind of roles that slaves play and the kind of situation they find themselves in. Um, and one of the, 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 the problems with comparing a comparison in this case is that um, slavery in the Middle East is often compared to Atlantic slavery, to slavery in the Americas. And this gives rise, I think, to a fundamental misunderstanding because you then have um, comparisons between the power of an abolitionist discourse in the USA and Europe and the apparent absence of, a, of, a, of a, uh, an abolitionist discourse in the Middle East and in Iran. And what I wanted to do was to show that this was a false comparison and that Iran had its own way of understanding agency and its own form of abolitionism because slavery did, wasn't ab abolished overnight, but it did uh, wither and finally die more or less in the Middle East. And the, the, the the character of slavery determined the kind of agency that slaves were able to deploy. So in the case of, of plantations in the Southern States of America or in Latin America, you can see that you have a situation where slaves are gathered together in very large numbers uh, and obliged to do very hard work and they are deprived of any sort of access to um, the possibility of manumission. So if you are a slave, you, you, you will die a slave and your children will be slaves. In the Middle East, the situation is different um, because most slavery is domestic slavery uh, and it's often uh, gendered. Many, by the 19th century, the majority of slaves are women. So of course, as far as a, an American plantation is concerned, the natural thing is a slave uprising. And there are many of them, and Haiti is the most famous. If the majority of slaves are women and in some sort of form of domestic dependence with emotional bonds involved, the only strategies available are quite different. And strategies are deployed even by uh, women in those situations in the Middle East. So, Slaves in the Middle East do possess agency, but the kind of agency it is depends upon and is, is structured by the particular position they themselves offer. And of course, slavery does, it does wither in the 19th century. Um, and it not only does it, it wither because elites lose interest in it to some extent, because the old extended aristocratic household also declines. So the social role that slaves have performed tends to, 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 to eat or, or, or vanish. Um, but what's interesting, I think, in the Middle Eastern case is also that you have this development of solidarity with slaves among free white people. I mean, I use the word white in a, in a kind of contra to contrast them with the black slaves. Um, and there is a real sympathy amongst, for example, the Iranian lower class population for slaves, because they start to see slavery by the constitutional period, they see slavery as emblematic of the despotism of the constitutional period. So for Iranians themselves, um, this question of importing black slaves in particular from Africa and losing their own people who are being enslaved by the Turkomans in the Northeast, slavery becomes a key trope in the oppositional movement, which leads to the constitutional revolution. So I think subaltern sympathy with slaves is, is, a, is a subject which requires and would, would repay some more investigation. The final chapter of the book is on unveiling. Again, it, it might appear at first sight that unveiling is a rather niche kind of um, topic. But again, as with the earlier chapters, what I really wanted to do is to look at this comparatively and try, try to understand something much bigger about gen changes in gender relations, changes in how uh, women themselves intervened to um, express their views on, on their own situation. It was no longer a question simply of men 
deciding upon emancipation as a nationalist project, but women themselves are engaged in this with, with um, journals and, uh, and so on. Um, and so I think unveiling can actually tell us a great deal about modernism, about agency, and about the meaning of gender uh, as, as, as these changes are implemented. Um, so it's, it's a broad view of Iranian history, which is trying to say some things about um, the logic of change and it's, it's uh, the, the clarification that can come by taking it out of its national frontiers and looking at it from a slightly different perspective. And, um, well, I'm interested to see what, what people will say. Um, so th thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much for that fascinating presentation. Uh, everyone, if that sounds at all interesting, please do check out Dr. Cronin's new book because it is even more fascinating when you go into the details there. And just being able to see things especially I really liked, I don't often see things through the bottom-up approach. So I, I, that was probably the most interesting aspect to me was just the amount of bottom-up approaches that I was able to see in your book, Dr. Cronin. Thanks again for that presentation. And I'm going to remind y'all in the uh, Zoom crowd, please, if you have any questions, feel free to either post them in the chat or email them to media at iran1400.org. And one last thing before we begin, I wanted to give a quick thanks to a team member uh, at the Iran 1400 Project, Christian. He was unable to be here today, but he provided a lot of questions for us. And he also read Dr. Cronin's book, and he himself really enjoyed it as well. And so thank you, Christian, for all of the questions that you provided. While we give the audience some time to think of questions, I'll begin with one of Christian's questions. His first question was, much of your book discusses events which occurred in Iran during the last century in the context of global social history. Would you say that Iran has a unique relationship with modernity when compared to other countries? How exactly would you characterize that relationship over the past century? Oh, it's an interesting question. Um, but the, 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 what I, I, I tried to do, I think, as, as I said, um, much of the literature looks at what makes Iran unique. And undoubtedly, there are some things which are quite specific to the Iranian experience of, of the social life and political life. And a lot of, a lot of uh, work has been done on them. But what I was interested in really was not what made Iran different, but what Iran had in common with other places. Because I think there's a lot less attention paid to this. And actually Iran has a lot in common. Not, not in, I'm not talking about politics you know, at, at the level of states, but in terms of how people organize their lives what's important to them um, and how things change over time and how people react to those changes. Because I think there's something quite, quite universal about this, um, that if you look around the world, you see not just in the Middle East, but beyond the Middle East, um, the same kinds of, of, of phenomena, um, modernism itself, has been really a, a kind of global phenomenon. So I think what I've tried to look at, of course, there are unique, there are some, no one would deny there are unique features to, to Iranian life, society, politics, and so on. Um, but I wanted to do something different, which was to look at the similarity. So that, that's what I've done. And it's not to deny, of course, that there are, there are not, every country has its own unique characteristics. Um, but sometimes I think that what they share is, is much more powerful than what separates them. Thank you so much for that elaborate response. Uh, the second question 
as we gather more questions is in your second chapter, you bring up the phrase moral economy and the theories of the British historian E.P. Thompson. Thompson, as you note, viewed the market in pre pre-industrial societies as the primary arena of class. When prices rose, the poor became particularly conscious of their collective power. As industrialization increased, the workplace, the factory, the mine, the oil rig became that arena. As many societies, including Iran, have entered post-industrialization, where exactly is that arena today? Certainly not on Twitter or Telegram, dot, dot, dot. That, that was uh, Christian's second question. Thank you. It's, it's, it's also very interesting. Uh, yes, and that's absolutely true. Uh, very accurate uh, description of Thompson's views that he thought the, the moral economy, or, or at least the bread riot, was a phenomenon of, of pre-industrial countries. That in, in, in pre-industrial countries, class conflict took place in the market over prices. And he thought that that changed. And from when he was writing in the 1950s and 60s, it was the case that this method of, of waging class war, if you like, changed uh, uh, and moved to factories uh, with trade unions and uh, political parties which represented the interests of, of, of the working class. So class conflict was going to take place through strikes, for example, through political parties um, trying to gain power through parliamentary means. So in the 50s and 60s, that looked like an irreversible process. But of course, what we see, uh, as, as is pointed out, is that we, we, we've gone beyond that period where most people were employed and found the focus of their kind of um, their, their strategies for bettering themselves. They, they, these have been lost for many people. And we do see the reappearance of these kind of popular, even bread riots, um, street protests against about many sorts of things, but actual bread riots have reappeared. And I think E.P. Thompson would have been very surprised by this. Um, but the fact is that you have, for example, with the countries are demanded by the Inter International Monetary Fund to remove subsidies on, on basic foods, for example, the price rockets, and the population responds much as it did in the 19th century. So you have, it's like a, a wheel turning. You have this, this method of taking action in the 19th century and before that, which changes with industrialization, with the development of uh, modern politics, but which now is going back to the 19th century and beyond again. So I, I think that's, that's quite interesting. And, and the bread riots now, again, when you see, and there are plenty of examples of them, uh, and you see they're always accompanied by this idea that this, this for example, prices of bread rocketing is something more early on with it. People feel this very deeply. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you so much for that great response. Uh, our first audience question that we have ready is, how would you situate your work in relation to Frederick Cooper's critique of the notion of modernity? There's a, also a, a, another one here about multiple mo modernities, I think. Um, the thing I think which struck me is about modernism and about modernism as it's adopted by modernizing states is that it, it, it seeks to homogenize. Um, so it's trying to create, for example, um, uh, a national context, a national consciousness out of very diverse reality. Uh, so in the case of Iran, you have, uh, beginning a little bit in the constitutional period, but really developing in the early Pahlavi period, you have this idea to create Iranians. So you have to not just put forward a kind of positive notion of what an Iranian is, but you've got to get rid of all the things that stop people being modern. 
So you have this succession of um, policies which are imposed very forcefully in terms of making people look the same, in terms of making them speak the same language, uh, giving them the same kind of education, putting them in the army so they're actually literally in uniform. So I think this is what the early phase of, of, of modernism does because it wants to get rid of the old idea of mosaics and um, leaving people out of the reach of the state. Because what it, it wants to do is establish its own unmediated control over individuals. So in the Iranian case, you see the closing reforms, you see the conscription, um, you see also people are encouraged to, to join, I mean, again, extension of the military side of things, but scouting movements. Putting people in uniform is a kind of obsession in the interwar period. So you do actually succeed to some extent in this, in this process. And by the 1950s, you know, Iran looks like a modern state. Um, but of course it conceals a much more interesting reality because of all sorts of ways in which people resist this, the imposition of this uniformity. And again, it, the, the resistance reappears in, in all sorts of ways. Um, so, and again, you can look at uh, Iran now and you can see ways in which people defy the attempts of the authorities to insist on a certain kind of identity by clothing, for example, by the kind of music that you listen to through drugs. Um, so I think this idea of what modernism and modernity is, 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 is quite uh, sensitive to wider, wider political and social changes. Thank you, Professor Cronin. On that note of uh, multiple modernities, the next question, which might have some overlap with the previous answer, uh, thank you very much for this fascinating talk. Would you consider the idea of multiple modernities useful in understanding the development of modernity in Iran? Mm, I think probably I just I just said what I had to say on that. Okay, great. On all sorts of grounds, so. Perfect. Thanks. So the question after that, Iranians being enslaved by the Turkmens was new to me. Can you elaborate on the nature of this enslavement? Yes, um, there's actually some interesting new work being done on it. Um, and it's quite, it, it, I was quite surprised as well by, by what I read here, because um, I think it's, it's quite well known. And there's a book called The Daughters of Kuchan, uh, which dealt with an episode uh, when the local population was impoverished and starving. Um, and their daughters were either kidnapped or, or sold into slavery um, in, in the Northeast uh, on the frontier with uh, Central Asia. And this became a, a, a trope of the opposition in the constitutional movement because it was used to demonstrate that the despotism of the Qajar Shahs was so devastating in terms of its impact on the population that they couldn't even manage to feed their own families and had to to resort to these methods. But the, the issue of, of slavery in relation to Central Asia is quite a big one during the 19th century. And there is a lot of diplomatic activity between the Iranians and the Imperial Russians about what can be done about this. Because for the Russians, the suppression of slavery was one of the key legitimizing justifications for their expansion into Central Asia. Of course, it's, it's rather similar to, to, to Europe and the US that they gained, they gained um, moral credibility by claiming that one of the reasons why they were in Central Asia was the suppression of slavery. And the Iranians, of course, had an equal interest in the suppression of slavery in this part of the world because it was really quite a bit of a problem throughout the 19th century. Uh, and as I say, it becomes an issue in the constitutional revolution. Um, uh, and of course, under Reza Shah, these things are, uh, frontiers are solidified. 
and slavery, and slavery I think was abolished in the constitutional period and it was abolished again in 1929. It was still going on in, 19, in the 1920s, but with, again, the arrival of borders, policed borders, um, and some sense of an individual connection to the state, then, then slavery with the divide was when the, the, the Soviet Union fully uh, established itself in Central Asia, then it could, it could stop this. Uh, but it took most of the 1920s to do it. Um, and uh, if, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, I can look up the references for this work. Um, this is very interesting. Thank you. We also had a question or a comment from the audience saying that there's a good new book on ah. slavery in 19th century Central Asia. Yes, I think that's probably the one that, uh, that, that I'm quoting here. Perfect. Uh, the next question, is there a danger that your approach to subaltern groups in relation to modernism is in danger of reifying the old idea that such groups are traditional and opposed to new developments? Yes. The word, I mean, the, the word traditional is a bit, is, is kind of got uh, red lights around it because we don't like using it anymore. Uh, I, I do think that um, it's, it's not, I think, accurate to generalize that any group, subaltern elite, they have complex attitudes towards change. It's not the case, I think, that subaltern groups are more resistant to change than other groups. I just think that they perceive the balance of advantage and disadvantage differently. Uh, which makes it appear as though they're opposing change, whereas in fact what they're opposing is, is the way change is being carried out. So, for example, um, if you look at the, 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 the town planning in the 20s and 30s in Iran, I mean, it's called town planning, very destructive. Now, for the, the, the prosperous middle classes, there was an attractive development because you have the building of these modern apartment blocks with modern facilities, which are convenient, um, and they're connected to shopping malls and parks. So you have the development of a new kind of city. So if you are inhabiting uh, dwelling in the old city, which has not got proper sanitation, which has not got proper cooking facilities, which is, is difficult to maintain. And you have the option of moving to a nice apartment in, uh, in North Tehran, uh, then this looks like a good thing for you and, and you're happy with it. If you're a poor person in the old city, and you, you haven't got the means to move to a nice apartment. So what happens is that you're stuck in a kind of ever deteriorating urban environment. Then of course, the project of town planning and modernization looks different to you and you probably don't like it. But you don't, it's not because you have some kind of blanket resistance to change. It's because the impact of change is different and usually negative for you. And that's what, what, what people didn't like. I mean, you do find, of course, when people are offered genuine improvements to their lives, they tend to grab them with both hands. Um, but the, the experience of modernism is, especially for the, 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 the less privileged, the experience is authoritarian and usually involves them in some unwelcome activity. Again, you can look at the question of unveiling so for the Tehran bourgeoisie, who were already unveiled anyway, this was merely a confirmation of the, the rightness of their lifestyle. But if you look at a poor woman in, in the old city who hasn't got the money for Western clothes, who hasn't got the money for hairstyle, who hasn't got the money for cosmetics, of course, this question of unveiling appears completely differently. 
So I think I think it's it's complicated. And what it's interesting to try to do is look at the balance, at the the positive and the negative as it affects different categories of people. And, you, and I think you come up with something a bit more cautious than simply saying, well, these people don't like, they're just you know, traditional, they want to stick to things the way they, they were. Um, but it, it isn't quite as simple as that. Is it? Thank you for that great response. Our next question so how can we use the material collected from subaltern participants in the upheavals of 1977 to 82 by uh, VL and Josro Havar? Or v- VLA, sorry, I'm, I'm not I'm entirely sure that. how to pronounce that. Uh, okay. Um, well, there's now a big literature on oral history and, and memory studies. And I think we have to think about these, the issues that are raised in this literature when we evaluate what those kinds of collections can tell us. Um, of course, one of the big problems is that if people are interviewed about something many years after the event, then their, their attitude towards that event is going to be colored by the experiences that took place in between. And I think this is one of the things that we have to be careful about is taking, taking testimonies too much at, at face value. We have to, again, look, look a little at the context when, when the, uh, the, the testimonies were collected, by whom, are they representative? Um, what, what, how, to what extent have they been inflected by that, the experience of a particular individual or by the general direction of Iran after ni- the early 1980s? So there are all sorts of ways in which these sorts of, of, of oral histories or memories can be used, but you have to get them carefully contextualized. Having said that, of course, they can shed a fan- fascinating light on what people thought they were actually engaged in, how they experienced it, how they were perhaps disappointed, disillusioned as time went on, how did they react? What happened to them? Did they stay in Iran? Were they in exile? And what was the experience of that? You know, the experience of exile after the early 1980s. So I think you need to be very careful about this kind of material, but there's no substitute for it in terms of what you can do with it uh, if you apply these kinds of... uh, these kinds of caveats, but a, a, a personal testimony, you know, it just, it can be fascinating. You know, you just listen to it and you're transported into another time. Thank you. Our next question is, do you find it useful to draw on the work of Bayot and James Scott on the strat- strategies of the powerless? Um. I think Asaf Bayat's work's been very important. Um, as he was the first person, or one of the first people to try to look at, at subaltern groups as, as, as important and significant actors in their own right. So I think that's been, that's been very important for generally uh, social historians of Iran and, and of the wider Middle East. Um, I think in terms of this, this idea of, 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 of effecting wider political change through the accumulation of uh, acts of, of challenging uh, is a little bit more problematic. But I think his descriptions, for example, of, of street politics, of the unemployed, it's, it's clearly uh, an influence which has affected the way an entire generation of social historians um, 
see these things and he's, he's highlighting of, of the relevance of these groups and the importance of these groups was, was vital, has been very productive. James Scott, again, he hasn't um, written directly on Iran, but again, he's been a crucial influence, I think, on everyone who wants to, to look at history from below. And uh, again, in terms of the wider political vision, it's more controversial, but in terms of his analysis of how ordinary people manage their lives, is again very important, you know, the famous weapons of the week. This is, is in every, every single publication on social history from below quotes James Scott, Scott on the weapons of the week. And I think that in itself takes uh, his, his, his influence on, on all of us and, and including me. Thank you for that fascinating insight on works of scholarship. Uh, the next question, might it be useful to see subaltern groups engaging with or negotiating or actively managing change and newness rather than simply uh, either opposing or accepting them? Yes, I think that's, that's quite right. Um, we need to look at uh, how people actually deal with things without... The, 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 the thing about modernism is it tended to create homogenous groups. So the tendency of modernism is to categorize uh, subaltern groups in a certain way and to make them all the same, to, to kind of impose, in order to manage them better, to see them as a single homogenous group which reacts in a single way to certain kinds of, 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 of policies imposed on them. But I think, as 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 the person said, um, engaging engaging with negotiating, actively managing change and newness is a very good way of putting it. I think that's how, that's how what we need to see. We need to see the, the the reality of it, not to see it through the vision of these hom homogenous groupings, but but to look at it, break it down a little bit, and and, and study it a bit more closely, and see where this takes us. Yes. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Christian. He asks, in the chapter, The Dark Side of Modernism, you investigate the position of various underclasses of society, prostitutes, criminals, beggars, and their relationship with modernity in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, you state that like criminals and prostitutes, beggars could be re rehabilitated by the by an energetic paternalism. This energetic paternalism, you say, served as a demonstration of modernity. This demonstration stemmed primarily from national governments, their newly established police brigades, and their efficient propaganda machines. Can we say the same for the 20th century, 21st century? What role does Western intervention, both political and cultural, play in redefining energetic paternalism as a demonstration of modernity in our, our current century? Yes. Well, that's a big question. Um, it's certainly the case, I think, that modernism requires a kind of legitimizing notion so if you're going to, for example, um, imprison people for committing crimes, and let's remember that imprisoning people for long periods of time is a very new thing in Iran. It, it hasn't been done traditionally. It really begins in the 1920s when there's this massive program of prison building. Um, but the, 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 the iron fist is never enough. You also need the velvet glove. And I think it was necessary, and maybe it was even genuine on the part of, for example, the intelligentsia, to see uh, the, 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 the paternalism of the state as, as something genuine. The imprisonment was, for example, meant as a punishment, but it was also an opportunity for rehabilitation. And I think for, for modernism in general, that kind of 
uh, carrot and stick is important. And it's also, you find the intelligentsia, for example, justifying it and coming out with all sorts of reasons why this is a good thing. And it does require legitimacy for the authorities as well. Um, now, how seriously you take it is another question, because, of course, just to take the example of prisons, if you look at prisons everywhere, you see that the, the, the rehabilitation, that, that dynamic of rehabilitation is more or less non-existent in reality. If you want to guarantee that a person, if you, you send a young man to prison, you almost guarantee that he will embark on a life of crime. Uh, so prison actually operates, you know, when you look at the actual experience of those social classes who are vulnerable to imprisonment, you see that it has the opposite effect to the one intended. Whatever the authorities say about their paternalist, they articulate their paternalist discourse, in fact, prison produces recidivists. It doesn't rehabilitate in general. So I think there's the discourse, there's the sincerity of it, and it isn't always sincere. Um, and there's the, the, the reality of it, does it work? And I think in the case of when we look at Pahlavi or Iran, we can see that the, 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 the discourse of paternalism is quite strong, but we see that the, the experience of subaltern groups is not very much improved by that, that, uh, that discourse. And if you look at the films, they're, they're, they're on YouTube, the film of uh, the women's prison, for example, or the film of, um, of the red light district, you see very clearly the contrast between the paternalism of the discourse of the authorities and the reality of what actually happens to people when they find themselves coming into contact with these supposedly improving environments. Paternalism states, for example, in relation to the women's prison, that they can be taught literacy and found work and so on. And, and you see the reality, which is that these women have completely hopeless lives. So I think there's a question of how does it work out in, in any specific context? Um, and again, you, you do see, again, this discourse of um, bringing uh, improvement was and, and still is, to some extent, I suppose, a characteristic of American foreign policy. And again, you have to look at it, you know, how is it articulated? Um, who believes in it? Who is sceptical about it? And what are the actual consequences? You know, is the situation as the situation of women I mean, now in Afghanistan, of course, it's, it's all finished, but what was the impact on women? Not just women in Kabul, but women in Afghanistan more generally. What, what's the balance sheet? And we have to draw it up, I think, honestly, and uh, we'll try to assess this in, in, in a way that actually enables us to move forward, not just to repeat cliches from the past, but, um, you know, what, what, what does the balance sheet of Western intervention in the 20th and 21st century is? Good or bad? You know, no, 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 let's face facts about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Our, our next question is, in the same chapter on modernism and the politics of dress, you mentioned some theatrical performances of unveiling, including that of Huda Shurawi at the Cairo railway station. Mm -hmm. With this image, I immediately was reminded of the Women of Revolution Street protests, which broke out in the winter of 2018 in Tehran and throughout Iran. Can you speak to the relationship between such movements? both those triggered by Shara'awi and the women of Revolution Street, and class consciousness? Hmm. Well, in the Egyptian case, I think the, the contexts are different um, because in the Egyptian case, 
And in the other cases that I mentioned, you know, in, in, in the case of, of um, Central Asia uh, and in the case of Iran after the mid 1930s, these, these, these theatrical displays of unveiling are moving with the grain of the authorities and of um, um, the, the, the modern intelligence in general. They're moving in favor of unveiling. So the, 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 the performance is designed to attract attention, to demonstrate to other women what's happening um, and to push, push the government forward. Um, so of course, Reza Shah, uh, well known for being in favor of unveiling and imposing it with force. Um, but the general trend of opinion among the educated elite was in favor of unveiling, and many women had already begun to unveil in both Egypt and Iran. So I think these were not safe exactly, because of course the women who, who engaged in this were putting themselves at some risk of, of slander and so on. But they were working with the grain of the authorities. Whereas in Iran, you see something slightly different, which is that dress, women's clothing, hijab, has become, whether justifiably or not, but it is taken to be uh, often a symbol of resistance to the wider politics of the Islamic Republic. So it takes place in an atmosphere of opposing the authorities, which gives it quite a different character, I think. Um, that if Arawi was sufficiently elevated socially to be quite protected from any kind of negative comment by society in general. Um, and of course, the Shah used his own family to demonstrate the virtue of a European hat uh, in the 1930s. So these women were high status and protected even though what they did was still courageous, but they were not running the risk of being seen to be politically oppositional. And I think that's what gives the, the difference between the two situations. Um, of course, it's, it's to do with the wider issue of, um, of women's autonomy. The debate about what matters more, is it the society or the individual's right to choose? And these are, these are big debates which go well beyond Iran. But of course, if you're, dem if you're using clothing to demonstrate your opposition to the wider project of the Islamic Republic, then the consequences are going to be quite different as well. And the kind of significance of what you're doing is different. Huda Sharawi, she had intelligent, and intelligent opinion was on her side. And that she could draw power from that. What the Iranian women do, you know, they, they saw them right at the beginning of the post-revolutionary period. This is again, it's still using dress as a political issue. And perhaps we can't get away from that. But context matters, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Thank you again for that fascinating insight. This will be our last question before we wrap up the event. I was wondering if you could discuss why the bread riots of Qajar, Iran were such crucial moments in the modern history of Iran and how and if we should view food shortages or economic hardships as catalysts for social change in the near future. Uh, I think the bread riots in the 19th century are interesting because they, they're a barometer of what's going on below the level of the, 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 the authorities and the monarchy and the government. Um, and what you do see, I think, is as the 19th century progresses, by the 1890s, they're very common indeed, and they become much more violent, partly because the, the, the local authorities react to a bread riot with violence. So there is a, a dynamic, which means that people start to get killed in quite substantial numbers. Now, 
it I argue in the book that this this anxiety over food and the disintegration of the older paternalism and the penetration of modern capitalism into Iran with the free market is a contributory factor for the constitutional revolution. Now, it's always difficult to prove things like this um, because how do you prove what was really a cause of the revolution? And, and, and all sorts of uh, things have been put forward as causes of the constitutional revolution. The revolution in Russia, which disrupted trade, you have the Japanese victory over the Russian empire, you have all sorts of things which are given as, as causes. But so far, nobody's really put forward this idea of the immiseration, the increasing immiseration of the Iranian poor, and their increasingly desperate attempts to guarantee the sustenance of their own families. I think it's, it's, it's reasonable to think that this contributed to the constitutional revolution. Um, again, it's, you say, because bread riots possibly con con contributed to the constitutional revolution, but that doesn't mean that all protests about food shortages, dearth, price rising are going to lead to political radicalization. They can be just protests about food. And there are many, many protests all the time about all sorts of things which affect people's daily lives. And most of them, 99% of them, don't lead to revolutions, um, but sometimes they do. And I think that's one of the puzzling things about revolutions in general, that they come out of the blue. With hindsight, you can come up with reasons for them, but at the time, Nobody was expecting uh, a huge upheaval. If you look recently at the Arab Spring, this began, as we know, in Tunisia. And I think you will look in vain for any prediction, any, any consciousness the day before that happened, that there was going to be this huge upheaval across the Middle East. No one saw it coming. And that's, that's the thing about revolutions. There's something very hard to grasp about why a revolution in one context and not in 99 similar contexts. That's what it's so hard to, to actually grasp. And um, it's something for us to think about, I think. Thank you. That is the perfect note for us to end on. So once again, thank you so much, Dr. Cronin, for joining us today at the Iran 1400 Project. If you all enjoyed the talk today, which I am sure that you did, uh, you, of course, can find much more information about all the topics that we touched on by buying Dr. Cronin's book, Social Histories of Iran, Modernism and Marginality in the Middle East. It's available from Cambridge University Press. And for attending the event today, you will receive a 20% discount code. Uh, you should receive a promotional code to your email. And lastly, if you want to learn more about a variety of topics about Iran, please do check out Iran 1400 Project uh, at our website or on social media at Iran 1400 Project. We have upcoming uh, we have upcoming spotlighting and author events with Ali Fatola Najad, Iran in Emerging New World Order, and that's on December 17th. And then we also have another spotlighting and author event with Ali Alfone, Political Secession in the Islamic Republic of Iran, and that's on January 7th, uh, 2022. So looking into next year. And that is it. Once again, thank you so much, Dr. Cronin. Please go out and buy her fascinating book and you will find so much incredible relevant information on a topic that, as you mentioned at the beginning of your book, is not often worked on. So that that's another fascinating part is this was very well needed in the area of Iranian scholarship. So thank you for this uh, fascinating insight into a topic not often uh, touched upon in Iranian studies. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.